If you've been looking at the drone down the back, you've been waiting for this. Uh, Danu and Tane, where are you guys? Come to the stage. Tane runs Maui 63. You're going to hear a little bit about it, I expect. Danu runs the bear in hand. Good boy. Uh, runs Rush. Rush are another one of the uh, awesome partners uh, for this month's event. Um, so you guys are just going to do a little switcheroo of the laptop uh, as, we, as we switch over. Which is awesome. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Chief Technology Officer. Uh, I'll hand over to you guys. Please welcome Tane and Danu to the stage. Oh yeah, stand right here. Thanks everyone, what a handsome crowd. Uh, fantastic turnout tonight. Yeah, well done Justin. Um, yeah, we've got a couple of partners in the crowd and customers and stuff like that, so thanks for, thanks for showing up. Um, really excited to get into it. Um, hope everyone's had a good look at the the drone, um, and yeah, Tane is going to get into that really deep. So, uh, so meaningful applications of vision technology. Now, I could try. I, I tried to cram in more buzzwords, but the word wrap uh, took care of that. But really, um, I guess the thing that we want to talk about is uh, kind of the fledgling nature of machine learning and artificial intelligence right now. Like, it seems I think you know for a couple of months, years. Um, it's felt like we haven't really found that killer use case for machine learning. I'm going to talk about why I think that is, um, but I also want to uh, exemplify, and, and Tane is a good, good example of one of those use cases that actually we just need to apply a little bit more creativity. And I think the meaningful component, um, I just want to talk a little bit about ethics. Um, so really topical, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, they're, they're, right now we live in a regulatory environment that is pretty much the Wild West. Um, and actually, your own moral compass uh, is actually gonna matter a lot in this space. So uh, Rush is an interesting company. We started it about 10 years ago, um, straight out of university. We're about 100 odd staff now. Um, and over the years, uh, the kind of the draw card for me personally, and, and why I started the journey, was that technology was a massive democratizer. You know, with my background as an immigrant, uh, my parents worked, worked hard as, as many of the people in the audiences would have, and they built a platform of privilege that allowed me to kind of reach new heights, I guess. And technology was the thing that actually enabled and facilitated that. Um, I had a skill um, and my team, um, and I'm sure Tane can speak to this as well. Uh, it, it, just, it just levels the playing field, and technology is one of those amazing things. It, it amplifies your potential it makes you a better version of you if you apply it correctly. And over the years, we've kind of honed in on that purpose statement to sort of talk about technology and care about it in a way that is really meaningful. And we have this guiding statement. We design and build technology to better serve humankind. And that's really a statement about developer privilege, our ability to wield technical skill and do meaningful things. And artificial intelligence is a huge step change in how we program computers. And that privilege applies there as well. And because of the amplification nature of AI, it's even more powerful. So just to credentialize ourselves, like why you should bother listening to us um, as, a, as a group, um, you know, Rush, Rush has worked with some amazing companies and we have some incredible talent and we're so proud of that talent being diverse and capable. Um, you know, we, we we run sort of Zed's loyalty program. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we worked with Google's uh, Google Brain team, the team that actually maintained the TensorFlow platform. Uh, if you go to the Google I.O. Uh, 2019 keynote, uh, one of our products is actually featured on that. Um, and we work with the Ministry of Health. Anyone using the COVID tracer app? That's, that's Russia's fault, so keep scanning, please. Um, but yeah, we've got a long history of this type of innovation. And I think the, the X factor that the company has is is really just about being purposeful with technology. So computer vision, we're here to talk about AI, we're here to talk about specifically computer vision. Um, and if you look over Rush Vision is a platform that we've been working on uh, for a long time. And actually there's, a, there's an interesting 
sort of belief about computer vision in particular. Um, we sort of developed our love for computer vision as a difficult problem space because we saw the potential through the work that we produced. And it's one of those things where the technology couldn't really keep up with the ideas, but we're at this weird inflection point where now actually the ideas are struggling to keep up with the technology. And you know, we, we developed the Z Fastlane system. That was about three years ago. Um, and that was just using simple AMPR to unlock gas pumps and provide a beautiful frictionless experience for customers uh, for payments. And that was a world first. And then I, apps like uh, Spark Kupu, which is the Tereo Maori translator, where you take a picture of something and it'll give you the Tereo translation back. Um, those are other examples where we were like, wow, you know, this computer vision problem space is actually really fantastic and can do a lot uh, if we can give it the resources that it needs. And we actually found the opportunity is that it's really difficult to operationalize. It's so hard to get all the data that you need, the costs involved in terms of training rigs and cloud environments and like, you know, with, with normal app development, you know, a mistake might cost you 10, 15 grand. With computer vision, a mistake can cost you half a million dollars. Like, you know, introducing bias into a health algorithm or something like that, you know, the repercussions can be actually quite, quite uh, daunting. And we sort of postulated that actually computers up until this point, uh, they don't have eyes. So if you were taking human intelligence and you were, you were closing your eyes, if everyone just closes your eyes for a second, and I asked you to swap seats with the person next to you, that task becomes infinitely more hard in a physical domain. So computers not having eyes is actually a massive limitation on what you can do with computers, especially when you consider them operating in a physical domain. And the most interesting thing is computer vision is massively resource and bandwidth hungry. So if you think about, we've got this glass ceiling on compute power and resource and memory and internet bandwidth. And if you think about all of our applications, you can process 100 million credit cards uh, you know, with some pretty rudimentary uh, architecture and software now. But computer vision keeps constantly butting up against this glass ceiling. So what that means to me is that actually there's a whole space up there that is blocked by this capability ceiling. And every time we lift that ceiling, new capabilities are going to emerge from lifting that ceiling. And I'm a firm believer still in, in Moore's law. And there's a really, really uh, interesting point around operationalizing that. So when you say, actually, we've got a lot of potential left in computer vision and a lot of potential left in artificial intelligence, why, you know, uh, why, why, why do we have these mixed feelings about machine learning and computer vision? And you see headlines like this, that you know, just today, uh, there's some amazing footage of a Tesla Model 3 trying to kill its passengers. And it's, it's, still, it's still, to a computer vision engineer or a machine learning engineer or software programmer, it's still an incredible piece of software. The fact that we have, have the ability to even, for a, for a, a vehicle that's $50,000 and available at mass market to, cons to even understand around. I know, I know fully grown adults who don't understand roundabouts. And for, for a Tesla to, to sort of navigate that, it's quite an achievement. And we see this a lot of market movement from giants like Intel, you know, spending $16 billion on Mobileye, which is the stereo cameras that you see in modern vehicles. That's all Mobileye. But for a company like Intel, specializes in, in chips to just step out of their kind of zone and say, hey, automotive and computer vision go together, and we're going we're gonna to place a really big bet here. Uh, you know, that says something. But we also have a lot of bad. And I think this is the awkward bit. And this is, this is the operationalized computer vision. This is the challenge. This is the thing to solve for. Um, and the thing that, you know, Maui 63 have actually shown a fantastic fit-for-purpose use case. And... It's really, it's really, it really comes down to this commoditization curve. You know, designing, you can't tackle every single problem with AI. It's just, it's just not possible because it's just bad to do. You know, if you were starting a business, what's the number one thing that people tell you about starting a business? Focus. And it's the same with AI. If you have a set number of resources to allocate, then you should allocate them on problems that actually suit the solvability of AI. And there is a glass ceiling. 
And this commoditization curve is roughly where the glass ceiling is. So if you're going to solve problems in 2020, your glass ceiling has to fit you know, what our capabilities are for that. And for our vision and the platform, and you know, use cases like Maui 63, it's about augmenting the human, not trying to replace the human, and actually finding use cases where you, know, you don't have to pursue 100% accuracy. Actually, what you can do is improve the human's productivity by 80%, where you can, you can do four out of five of the things that is a complete waste of time for a human, where you have this exponential complexity curve you know, where you need human judgment, you need human emotion. Leave that for the human and let the computer handle the simple, the black and white stuff. Did they run a red light? Yes, no, you know, that kind of thing. And this commoditization curve is, is, is just ever increasing. And, you know, the, the platform that we're trying to build is betting big on AI operating in sort of a 5G radio cloud environment and that the, the, the laws of, of, of exponential growth in terms of compute power will continue. And you know this new sort of next 3D chip architecture that's that's around. You know this is from TSMC, one of the largest semiconductor makers in the world. They're they're showing like ridiculous numbers. Like surely that's a typo, like 19, nearly 2,000 times an improvement. Um, but it kind of makes sense if you break it down and you say actually yeah we're adding layers to a 2D chip. We're basically multiplying how a 2D chip operates. It, it makes sense. So I think us having lived with a legacy of 10 years, are not qualified to predict what the next 10 years will actually include because we don't have a monopoly on good ideas and we have a whole bunch of bias that we're walking into the room with. And the vision for, for our platform is basically to make all of those difficult use cases really accessible, allow people to plug in their data, allow people to get a big picture view and perspective of what they're trying to do and make all of the difficult components that you need in a machine learning workflow just work, make it hidden. And what we hope to achieve by that is to commoditize computer vision. We want to make fantastic use cases that allow their creators to focus on the problem space, not focus on how do I manage GCP architecture with a GPU instance to do all this training, or how do I tag data, or you know, all of those kinds of things. And the goal is really to hide complexity. For us, because we believe the problem space is so massive, the potential is so huge, you know, anything, any application that deals with physical domain is basically addressable by computer vision in some form. Uh, either by incremental improvement or by step change, we actually wanted to focus on sort of three areas where we want to make spaces safer. So we want to use computers to help monitor environments and help businesses, uh, you know, meet their obligations to their employees, and also just you know allow new operating models where you know safety thresholds can be met with full strong automation. And in terms of business opportunities, there's a huge amount of business opportunities in terms of customer experience, delivering fantastic customer experience. We, we firmly believe that computer vision and machine learning can deliver a huge improvement or step change in usability and user experience. Where we went from like discrete buttons on a mouse and a keyboard to a screen, to a touch screen, there's a future where actually computers can pick up body language, computers can understand nuance through visual interface, and there are situations, you know, maybe you're skiing on a mountaintop where a touchscreen is completely inappropriate that computer vision could assist with. So we see there being a potential for a step change in sort of the usability. And overall, just improving performance. And I think improving performance is the, is the use case that we're sort of talking about today where we want to take data, we want to understand insights in a, in a holistic way, in a top-down, high-level high, high kind of approach, um, with an understanding that the physical world is really complex and that you can have all the data in the world and you can draw not a single insight. And there's a huge difference between insight and, and data. And our goal is basically to facilitate these kinds of vertical capabilities. 
So there's a whole bunch of complexity. You can see you know, all of your IoT devices, sensors, images, cameras, drones, for example, um, feeding up through a, a, a data pipeline with all of your predictors, your machine learning models and your AI models. And that actually doing something useful is the thing that we're trying to do. So you can trigger workflows, you can send alerts, integrate with CRM, webhooks, all of this practical stuff. And we hide the complexity of the machine learning. We hide the complexity of the retraining and the data labeling and all of that muck, as it were, to a business. Um, and we give you this centralized view. And, and that's, that's sort of the nutshell of what we're trying to do with the platform. And I think that's a good crossover to Tane. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself. So um, I'm from Maui 63, and um, we'll cross back to our vision and how they're supporting us on our journey in a minute. But I thought I'd give you a quick introduction um, to us. So essentially, we're trying to bring innovative technologies like object recognition and the large drone in the background um, to help protect um, marine life, um, especially our native Maui dolphin, which is critically in danger. So I'll just give you guys a quick through um, of the problem. So if we talk about the Maui dolphin, um, there's only 63 left. And the key threats to these dolphins are fishing bycatch. I don't think that means needs that much explanation. And the other being toxoplasmosis. So I'll give you guys a little run through of toxoplasmosis. So that's a disease that the dolphins can catch. And it actually comes from cat poo. Um, the little story I like to make up around this is, you know, there may be a lady on a hill somewhere on the west coast of New Zealand a crazy cat lady, um, and there's a whole lot of shit running off into the water that the dolphins are swimming in, and that's how they're catching this disease. So this is critical to those dolphins, and if you look at both of these issues, they're all geo-related. So if we can understand um, where these dolphins are, how they travel, um, where they are throughout the year, we can better understand how to manage these threats. So if you talk about current solutions and how to gather this data, um, typically it's just an annual survey. So this is in summer, and this is on a boat, and this is with a bunch of people driving around on a boat looking for dolphins. Okay, it, it does work, um, tagged with some genetic sampling, other methods, and it's not to be forgotten, but it isn't done frequently enough. And so the other method is aerial photography or flying people around in a helicopter or a plane. This is really expensive, and you're talking about scientists with binoculars um, sitting in a plane trying to find dolphins in the ocean, and that, that's quite hard. And plus, um, someone had a smart idea to sell the only plane in New Zealand that could do that to the Australians, so we can't do that anymore either. So the solution to this problem in our eyes was um, sort of consists of three components. Um, the first one being an object recognition model. So for us, this doesn't only allow us to find dolphins if we're transecting the ocean, um, it actually allows us to spot them live and then follow them. So our drone can actually fly circles around the, drone, uh, around the dolphins and then follow them so we can start to understand movement patterns. So this brings me to our drone. So our drone can fly for six hours. Um, it's autonomous. Um, the one out the back is just our prototype, our real one. I'm not allowed to show to you guys yet. It's getting announced in about a month's time. Um, but it is here. Uh, um, but yeah, essentially it's remotely piloted, uh, flies at 140 to 160 k's an hour and for up to six hours at a time. And then the final component is what Danny's been talking about, is the visualization platform. So that is getting that data that we're collecting through to a platform that people that need to make informed decisions around protecting these animals, get it in a way that they can understand it, they can use it, and that can be accessible. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, a key vision of Maui 63 is to make this data public, and everything we do, in fact, we're trying to make public. So that means providing this data to government agencies, to universities, to scientists, to whoever needs it to help protect these animals from extinction, essentially. Um, so for the tech people that are here, I thought I'd delve a little bit into what we are running because um, we think what we've achieved is quite impressive. So we're running a NVIDIA Jetson Xavier AGX and we're running that on the edge. So we're running it on the drone and that's so as we spot the dolphins in real time, we can actually ask our pilot back at the base station, which you can see over there, hey, do you want to follow these dolphins? And he can say yes or no. From there, the camera and the gimbal system is automatically controlled and the plane starts to circle these dolphins. 
And then essentially we can leave that drone for however the remaining flight time is to really understand how they're moving and, and where they're going, all in an autonomous fashion. Um, what we achieved, which we're quite proud of, is um, we're running full 1080p video and we're running the object, object recognition model at 35 frames a second um, on the edge on a small Xavier um, running on battery. So we're quite happy with that. Um, if you really want to get into the detail, we're running Golo V4 Tiny um, on a TK DNN backbone. And, and something I'd like to mention here is you know, the support that um, we got from the open source community developing this. Like, this is a new space, and I think the open source community around it is amazing. I had a guy in Russia helping me build models to detect these dolphins better, just because he liked you know, what we were trying to do. There's another guy in Canada at the moment helping and providing advice on how to improve this. And these are just people supporting what they think is a good cause with good technology, which is pretty amazing to see. And then further to that, obviously, Russ has reached out and is helping us now, and actually we're looking to do some work with Curious as well, so that's pretty amazing. Um, and, yeah, so we're getting a 90% accuracy um, for one-metre dolphins um, when we're looking at 120 metres wide of sea at the moment. Obviously, we're looking at ways to improve that, uh, and I'm sure we will, but we think that's quite sufficient for surveying and statistically modelling the west coast of New Zealand. So, yeah, a little bit more about the drone. Um, I won't tell you if this is or isn't our drone, but it does look like our real drone. Um, so it is vertical takeoff and landing. So the, the main reason we went this is means we can launch from places on the west coast. So you've actually got cliffs right down the west coast of New Zealand. So it means we can take off and land like this, but then we actually fly like an airplane so we get that distance and that speed that we're after to be able to completely survey the oceans. Um, I've mentioned speed and time. Um, 1080p video, um, we've got a link, well current link is about 50k's from shore, but we can beef that up to 100k's, so we can fly completely out, we don't have to see the aircraft, it can completely do its own thing, we can see full video feed on the control station, we can also see all other commercial aircrafts in the area and they can see us, along with another a whole, whole lot of other safety features, so we can, fingers crossed, get approval from the CAA to actually fly this thing without being able to see it. Um, our flight paths are completely predefined, and then, like I said, once our object recognition model spots things, it can ask the pilots if it's happy to update that flight path. Um, that's more from a safety concern. We could fully aut automate that, but we won't quite yet. Um, another thing that we have on board, which is quite cool, is 50 times optical zoom. So say we spot some dolphins and we are doing following, um, our pilots will essentially zoom in on these dolphins and we can get full-sized views of the fins. So what that enables us to do is stack different models on once we've landed and we're analysing the footage to do things like unique identification. So we can say, cool, that's actually Mary down there. Um, and the last thing I just mentioned there is ADS-B in and out. That is so we can see in other aircraft and see us. Uh, I have a quick video, I hope, to give you guys a view. No. There you go of how this all comes together with the drone out in the back. Yeah, essentially you can see here um, us coming back in for a landing. So we fly like an airplane and we land and take off like a drone. So we can take off right next to some cliffs. Um, so next step, so we're sort of exiting our pilot phase now. And like I mentioned, we might have a new fancy drone. Um, and we're getting into building a continuous monitoring program. So this is obviously really important. Um, we don't actually know the frequency that we need to fly because no one really understands how these dolphins move and where they go and through all the seasons. So that's something to be determined. But currently we're thinking somewhere between two and four weeks we'd like to do a flight and well, multiple flights to survey that complete area from Bethel's Beach right down to Raglan of the west coast of the North Island. And that should give us enough flight time to um, model out that entire habitat. Um, the next thing I touched on earlier is, you know, improving these models and building new models. 
Um, Because obviously we're just spotting and following dolphins, but there's so much more that we can do. So one, for example, showing here is that um, the unique identification, so we can see who's travelled from where to where, which is really important if you're just trying to understand behavioural um, movements of these animals. And then further that, we're looking at things like water colours. Um, so really simple stuff. So we see some dolphins, and let's actually have a look at the surrounding area from them. So hopefully we can spot those parts of water where the crazy cat lady lives, and we can send someone down there to actually test the water so we can understand you know, where that problem is and solve it. It's, it's not a hard problem to solve. The dolphins just move around so far, it's really hard to pinpoint where it's coming from. And then um, the last piece that we're actually starting to delve into now is building predictive models. So this is really important um, for understanding where the dolphins transition and then where they're going to be. So if you think of fishing regulations now for the west coast of North Island, they've actually just been extended to 30 k's out from shore. That's a whole lot of area. And, and we understand that people eat fish and we need a fish and um, you know, completely restricting these areas isn't necessarily fair. Yes, it helps protect the dolphins, but at the same time, the dolphins may be 100 k from shore. We don't know. We don't have an actual understanding. So by collecting that data and then combining that with predictive models, we're hoping to get to a point that we can provide up-to-date data all year round. Um, one, that'll reduce our flight times. These animals are likely very habitual, so you know we may be able to hugely reduce our flight time. And we can do predictive modelling, and we're actually working with a couple of um, pretty amazing fishing companies, Sanford and Moana, um, and we're going to integrate that data with their boats as well. So above and beyond current New Zealand regulation, if we tell them we think or there is dolphins in this area, they're going to completely avoid them with all of their boats. So that's pretty cool. And I think that I will hand you back to Dana to talk a bit more about our vision. We're going to risk a live demo. <laughs> um, yeah, this diagram is actually the original diagram that Tane gave to us in terms of his manual workflow. Um, so that big route box is sort of where we're trying to seat the platform to take away a bunch of that load so that you and your team can just focus on actually solving the problem, right? Rather than doing all this plumbing. Um, okay, bear with me. So, I've preloaded everything. So this is, this is the platform. Um, when you log into it, um, we've got sort of this overview. That uh, we've loaded a couple of test flights in. Hopefully the Wi-Fi holds. Here we go. Yeah. So allows you to filter your data, and we have this entire tagging system. So in the, in the platform, any any data that's coming in, you get free form lexical tags. So it's basically string tagging. So any data coming in, you can give it a discrete tag, and that that can be things like test flight. I think that actually might be one of the, there you go, Maui 63 test flight. So that actually, the entire platform is completely accessible by API. The dashboard is is almost a convenience layer over the top of the API. Um, so you can see sort of a breakdown of your data. Um, you know, if we were to sort of take the last 90 days, we can see patches where we've got um, sort of different test flights. So when images have come in and when we've seen detections. Uh, we can see some of these group detections, which is handy um, in a computer vision platform. If it loads. There we go. Cool. So you can come in here, and we can see here that you know we've got our group detections. We can say, yeah, we can tell the system, yeah, that's correct. Feed that back straight in um, in a really simple user interface. So we have this concept of sites. Um, which is basically all of your IoT sensors, cameras, all of that stuff. Um, and we've got one drone loaded in here. You can, we've got a, a, a R-Vision mobile app as well. So when you're running proof of concepts, you can use a, an iPhone 11 or something with similar grunt to actually run a simple edge camera application that plugs straight into the platform so you can feed images in, kind of turnkey, really simple. Um, you can see this sort of site configuration where you can add tags, add GPS coordinates, and then configure the actual um, individual cameras that you have on your device. So you get this individual authenticated endpoint, um, and you know you can set up some health parameters, 
add in your tagging data, and then any data that's coming in through this sort of endpoint, um, you can sort of jump to a data explorer view and see any data that came through that endpoint um, completely tagged and viewable in this sort of operational view. Yeah, so fairly simplistic uh, for this use case, but the idea is that actually we've got a whole bunch of general use cases that you know we're, we're, we're honing in on. We have a, one of New Zealand's best AMPR models uh, for license plate recognition. We've also got the state of Victoria and, and most of Australia uh, covered off for AMPR, and that's sort of for the transport sector. Um, and yeah, I think pretty ambitious uh, product. And Showing the map. That's cool. The map. I mean, this is what's crucial for us. It gives us the ability to see where the dolphins are being spotted, and then actually researchers and scientists can go and have a look at those photos. Our researchers and scientists can go and have a look at those photos. And, and further from that, um, we can actually use these um, hungry students to tag our data and further refine our models, and we don't have to do it ourselves or pay anyone to do it. So all within the platform. And if you've ever tagged images before, um, you'll know that that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, I've done lots. Yeah, I think we've all done lost, lots. <laughs> Um, just, just to sum up, you know, our belief is computer vision has huge potential, um, and it's still, still nascent. Um, and actually, sort of a little bit of a takeaway message is that, you know, technology, arguably, people wielding technology have created a lot of the world's challenges today in terms of environmental pollution and and these kinds of things. But you know, just because that's the way it is doesn't mean that's the way it has to be. And actually, we can use technology. Uh, if we actually put our minds to it to solve all of these problems, you know, I often say to 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 people that I'm talking about the environment about, you know, we've we've caused a lot of the problems with plastics and oceans and stuff in the last 50 years. So never get disheartened that it's actually reversible. You know, maybe it'll take 100 years to reverse out, but that's totally achievable. It's totally doable. We just have to set our minds to it. Um, and I just wanted to take this opportunity as well to remind people to donate. This is a fantastic cause. So Russia's really gotten behind it. Um, not only are we sort of working together and, you know, uh, Tane has been amazing to work with, uh, really forward thinking, knows technology. It's so rare to come across people who kind of understand the problem and then also uh, are willing to put the work in to understand the technology and how you can apply it to solve it. Those are the, those are the types of people that you really want to back. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're hoping for a long and fruitful partnership. We're donating cash as well as uh, in-kind effort to, to build out the platform. Um, and I think if we could get more support from the public as well, um, this is a fantastic project. And in 10 years, you will be able to look back and say, hey, we saved the Maui dolphin. And the fantastic thing is it's literally a progress bar. It'll go 64, 65, 66, 65, 66, 67. So it's really easy to track. Yeah. I, I just want to add that any money raised, you know, will go to those next steps that we talked about before. So it is building those models that we can start to uniquely identify them and, you know, going towards our efforts for building those predictive models and actually paying our pilots and people on the ground that are doing everything for free at the moment. We've got we've only got so many hungry students. So. <laughs> Thank you.